Great. Got questions, okay? So please think about questions. Please try start chatting and typing them in. Um, you know, we're uh, let's let's make this interactive. Let's make this a dialogue. Okay. So uh, so that's the uh, uh, all right. So getting started. Um, you know, one observation I want to make before we get started is is that we are living in what we call I call a Lego block world. What does that mean? It has been never been more feasible to start a new company because if you if I take you back 20 years if you wanted to build a software company for example you'd have to build everything from scratch you know you'd have to write the software you'd have to build the hardware you'd have to sort of you know build the infrastructure you'd have to run it on your own computers and your own servers and so on but now everything is available like a lego block to us you have Amazon Web Services, you have Microsoft's Azure platform, you have uh, you know, Android and you have iOS. A 13 year old kid can write an application for a game you know, and, and, and attract a million customers, right? So it's a very exciting time. And, the, and, and, I, and I, I wanna add this to something to this as we move into the world of AI and machine learning again, the building blocks are there. It's open source, and when you know TensorFlow from 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 Google or you know PyTorch or uh, or Microsoft sort of uh, toolkit, all the building blocks exist. You don't need to write. So supposing you want to write an application for let's say agriculture, you know, in 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 Pakistan, you want to help the farmers to understand you know what aspect what how much irrigation they should have on their crops or what diseases their crops might have for that you need a machine vision algorithm some uh, an, an an algorithm that can analyze images <coughs> of crops and from there predict if there is a problem with uh, irrigation if there's a problem with pests you don't need to write that algorithm yourself you can borrow it from a library all you need to do is now focus on the application focus on the use case focus on the customer problem that you're solving right so it's a very exciting time to be an entrepreneur. And uh, you know, the level of entrepreneurial activity has gone up because of this Lego block world that we live in. So that's a very interesting and important point to make. So what are you gonna need? You know, so let me kind of like, you know, uh, give you an analogy. The analogy of a startup is like, uh, you know, I was watching this video the other day of, of how they make Halim you know, in a very large scale. Uh, in, a, in a restaurant in in in, uh, in old Delhi, and uh, so to make a recipe, make a make a beautiful dish, you know, you need a number of things. You need a number of ingredients, right? So these are the four or five ingredients that you need in order to have a successful startup. You're going to need an idea or a customer problem that is uh, interesting, viable, and so on. You're going to need a great team, right? A competent team that you can work with. Uh, the right capabilities and skills. You're going to need a good strategy or a plan that needs to put that, that uh, how you're going to you know, uh, go to market and uh, what customer problem you're solving and what are the tactics for uh, scaling up. You also need resources and, and financial resources. You need money. And then of course you need execution capability. You need to get stuff done, right? So, that, so those are the five things. However, if I give you the ingredients to a recipe, in, you can. It's, there's no guarantee that you're going to make a good meal. There's always a secret sauce. There's always something extra. Then there's also timing and luck that you need to add to this. Because I find that in many cases, startups are at the right place at the right time. You know, so they're, take, take for example, some of you, if you've been following the US market, you saw DoorDash went public last week. You know, and their valuation approached $100 billion, which I think is ridiculous. But still, why is the valuation so high? Because the timing is perfect. DoorDash got a really great helping of luck because of the pandemic. Suddenly, people are ordering food and the food delivery services have exploded in popularity. Uh, so, so that's sort of what you will need. Um, you know, um, are we okay with, can you, can you all hear me? Because I'm seeing some... Uh, Okay, yeah, because I had some. Yeah, I think zoom. it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. yeah, I had some Zoom issues before Zoom had crashed, but now I think it's 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 good. Uh, it's good. It's good, yeah. sir. All right. So, uh, so these are the questions I'm going to consider from an entrepreneur stand. What what's a winning idea? How do I know I have a winning idea for my startup company? What's a great team look like? Right. What capabilities do I need to bring on board for a game? You know, and uh, what do I need to do and think in terms of a plan? Right. What does the winning plan looks like? 
how about money how do i raise money where do i raise money what are the pitfalls and challenges in sort of you know getting the financial resources and lastly what are the issues or challenges that i'm going to face in execution right so that's those are the five questions we're going to focus on today so let's start with the the first which is what makes for a winning idea okay so um you know i saw this bumper sticker in california and it was actually a very nice <laughs> quote technology is the solution now what was your problem what does this mean sometimes i find entrepreneurs they start with here's my product and i and, and in fact many product managers i teach product management and the first thing i tell my students is you're not a product manager they're like what do you mean i'm learning product management what do you mean i'm not a product manager i said you're not a product manager you're a problem manager focus on the customer problem don't get fixated on the product don't get focused on your product by the way this happens even with very very large companies there's a company that you probably have been if you been following the us market it's called quibi right so quibi was a company started by some very very famous people you know jeffrey katzenberg meg whitman and it was for short form video that would be delivered over mobile devices now these were you know content that they created a huge amount of content and so on and this company failed recently after raising over 150 million dollars what was the problem they got fixated on their product which was this will be short videos only available on mobile devices now when customers say listen i'm in a pandemic i'm sitting at home why would i watch this video on my small phone i have the big screen tv but they're like no this only works on a small phone so they had all these sort of fixed ideas about what people would want to consume and you know don't get fixated on your product right focus on the customer problem so there's a there's an old saying in 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 business and that is if you build a better mouse trap the world will beat a path to your door the world will come to your door because you have a better mouse trap that is wrong folks people are not looking customers are not looking for a better mouse trap you know they might have a cat right they want to get rid of mice so we have a cat at home and she actually takes care of all of the mice so it's not about building the world's greatest mouse trap it's about focusing on what is the best way to solve the customer problem so always begin with a clear understanding of what is the customer problem you're going to solve right and this is a quote from Ravi Akela, you know, he's a guy I know, who's the head of product management at Autodesk, which makes CAD software, computer-aided design software. And he says one mistake that I have made before, and I see product managers make and entrepreneurs make, is that they start prioritizing solutions or feature ideas without thinking about the core problem and alternatives to the problem. Right. So the thing is that your product is only one solution to other problem uh, to to the problem. and you want to make sure that you're focused on what is the problem we're solving as opposed to what is the product we're building that is very very important because sometimes you realize that there are alternatives there are alternatives and that, that, that there is really no you know to give you an example you might think let's take the example of digital payments so digital payments in the us have just not taken off they've not taken off apple pay samsung pay all these you know google pay they've been all trying to do digital payments for a long time and there is just no traction why there is no problem to solve everybody in the us has credit cards we have debit cards we have alternate ways to pay so there is no friction to be eliminated there is no pain point and therefore fixating on you know digital payments as being a way to actually facilitate transactions is a non starter now come to pakistan come to india come to indonesia where in india when i grew up you know it would take a one full day to get a train ticket right you have to go to the railway station to buy the ticket and so on paying electric bills takes hours right takes days people have to physically go and pay bills so bill payment and there are only in india 30 million credit cards in a for 1.3 billion people so people don't have credit card they don't have debit debit card so uh, you know i serve on the board of reliance jio in india and reliance jio is now the world's largest mobile network you know we have 400 million subscribers and we carry 10% of the entire world's mobile traffic it's a phenomenal company that has been built all in the last 4 years with mukesh ambani's leadership so there our digital payments are taking off because we are actually we are, uh, working with the what we call the transit billers right the the bus company the the the, the train uh, railroads the uh, you know uh, the utility companies to be able to accept bill payment which is a big problem for and a pain point for people who don't have credit cards who have nothing but their phone so start with the customer problem okay so that's something to keep in mind and this is another very interesting insight that the the ceo black and decker used to say we don't sell drills 
we sell holes, right? Because the customer wants a hole. But it's more than that. Not only does the customer want a hole, they're asking several questions about the hole. Well, how fast is the speed with which the hole can be made? What is the accuracy of the cut? What is the safety of the device? What is the ease of using the device? How reliable is the device? Where can I buy the device? How much does it cost? What do I get technical support for the device? Now think about this, that if you are a professional carpenter, you may be worried more about the speed and the performance and the durability. But if I'm a uh, at-home hobbyist who is doing you know, casual work and is using a drill, I may care more about safety. I may care more about convenience and I may care more about price. So it's really important for an entrepreneur to understand where and how your product and service will be used, who is going to use it, for what purpose they're going to use, what is the job that you're going to do for the customer. Based on that, you get an understanding of what your product and idea needs to be, okay? Now, I wanna leave you with seven tests. As you look at any startup business, these are seven tests that will tell you, is it a good business? These are seven tests for the customer problem that you can apply to the customer problem. First, is the problem real? What does this mean? Well, sometimes, you know, we sit around a table and we say, you know, we think that this is a problem, but you know what? You're not the customer. Is it real means, is the, is the pain point real? Is the problem real? Have you done validation? What I tell my students to do and entrepreneurs to get out of the building, go talk to people, go talk to real customers because you know, you are not the customer. So make sure the problem actually exists and not just a figment of your imagination. Second, is it focused? Are you solving a focused problem? For example, consider a company like DocuSign. DocuSign, the, the name says it all. Their pain point that they focused on was very specific, which is how do I uh, reduce the pain point of signing and verifying documents electronically, right? Solve a focused problem. By the way, one of the things I like to say is, no market is too small if you go deep enough. Just go deep. Don't try to boil the ocean. Don't try to be everything to everybody. Third, is it a big problem? So there was a company I, I, I saw a few years ago. It was called hothothot.com. Hothothot.com. You know what it is? They sell chili sauce. They sell hot sauce online. Yeah, it's an interesting business, but how big is it, right? How many people have this problem? How many, well, how many customers are there? So... You know, you have to, so this is by the way, what is what we call the TAM, right? The total addressable market. How big is the total addressable market? So, so that's just something. By the way, there was a company I was looking at recently. It was called Cuddly, C-U-D-D-L-I. Cuddly was a dating site, but it was a dating site for nerds. It was a dating site for, you know, developers and engineers. Uh, problem is it's not big enough. It's not big enough. So you're just too focused on market. It's just not a big enough problem that, that nerd looking for other nerds, right? Is it a hard problem to solve? Is it technically difficult? Is there something that, that other people can't do easily, right? So when Google started out with, we're going to organize the world's information and make it useful for everybody. That's a tough problem to solve. Right? That's a difficult problem to solve. Or when Tesla started out by saying, we're going to build electric vehicles that will drive autonomously. That's challenging technically. So you have to ask the question, why can't somebody else do what you're doing? Right? Why can't somebody else do the problem? Fifth is obvious. Is it obvious? I've met some startup companies when I asked them, what do you guys do? 10 minutes into the conversation, I still don't know what they do. Right? because it's difficult to explain. By the way, this is what I call the grandmother test. You should be able to explain to your grandmother or to a five-year-old, what do you do? What is the problem that you solve, right? Is it an obvious problem? So, you know, so for, 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 for example, come, come consider a company like Open Table. The problem they solve is, we'll find you a restaurant reservation and tables that are open right now. It's an obvious problem. You don't have to explain. Open table. Is there an open table? Docu sign. Is there a document that needs to be signed? These are examples of companies that solve an obvious problem. Is it complete? This is important. That are you solving the part of the problem or are you solving the full problem? Right? So this is something that don't give a customer a partial solution because that's not going to be enough. You need to think about what is it that they need to do to solve the complete. So for example, you know, let's say you built 3D television. Samsung built 3D TV, right? Now, that's not all I want to buy. I buy TV, now what do I watch on the TV? So you also have to think about where is the content gonna come from? So the complete problem in that case consists not only of the TV, but it means recording devices, it requires glasses. Where am I gonna bring the glasses? What if I have six guests visiting and they can't watch the 3D TV, right? 
So you need to solve the complete problem. Lastly, is it a growing problem? Is it a problem that's going to grow, right? So that is, this is why we are so excited about companies like Airbnb because the problem is growing. I mean, there is like a, the, the market will continue to grow. It's as, you know, as, as, as opposed to other markets that might shrink over time as the problem goes away. For example, if you're Blockbuster many years ago, you know, the idea of sending out DVDs or renting out DVDs, it's a market that's declining. It's a market, or let's say you're in the enterprise software market and you're selling on-premise software to legacy, legacy software. That's not a market that's growing. So these are seven tests for the customer problem, okay? Overall, let me summarize. If you want to find a valuable problem to solve, ask yourself, what is the job I'm going to do for my customer, right? And when you decide what job you're going to do, ask three questions. Is it an important job? Is it something that's important for them, right? By the way, let me take an example of an Indian company that I, I, I visited last year in Bangalore called Baiju's, right? So you should check them out. Uh, they are now a... Uh, I think they have like a seven or eight billion dollar valuation. They do online tutoring, right? But they do online tutoring for science and math for middle school uh, children. Is it an important job? By the way, in emerging markets like India, I'm sure the same is true in Pakistan, a middle class family can spend up to 40% of their disposable income on tuition, private tuition, which by the way is becoming even more problematic now because of the pandemic and so on. So because the schools are useless in many cases, you know, the teachers are not the quality of instruction, particularly if you're going to a government school, public school, it's not that great. So, so people spend a lot of, and on the other hand, you know, it is very difficult to get into uh, engineering college, medical college, or any, any college for that matter. So is it an important problem? Absolutely, right? Is it a frequent problem, right? Is this something that people need frequently? By the way, my child needs tuition every day, every day. And they're going to need it for many, many years. And third, how frustrated are customers with the existing solution? And this was the issue with Baiju that the, the existing solution, which was the school, was not good enough. So you add these three things up. Is it an important problem? Is it a problem customers have frequently? And, and what is the level of frustration they have with the best available alternative? This will tell you the size of the opportunity. And that is why Baiju is you know, such a big business. Uh, so in summary, for the first part of what we were talking about the idea, here is a checklist for an entrepreneur. Who are the customers you're addressing, right? Who are your target customers? What are their problems? What is the pain point? What is the pain? What is the friction? What is the challenge? What is their you know, dissatisfaction that you're solving for? What evidence do you have that this problem is real, right? What research have you done? Have you gone and talked to customers? What are the, what do they do currently? What is the current solution approach? By the way, in the case of Baiju, the current solution approach was private tuition. Or the current solution approach was go to school or take tuition at school, right? Or parents teaching the kids themselves. Those are all the current solution approaches. What is lacking in these approaches? What are the, what's lacking with parents teaching their children? They don't have time. What's lacking with private tutors? The quality is uneven. And, you know, and, and I can't find a good tutor. How is your solution approach better than the current workarounds? By the way, in the case of Baiju, the thing that was really interesting about them was that they made learning fun. They made learning fun. When I spoke with them last year, they told me it takes them one week to produce seven seconds of video classes. Seven seconds of video takes one week because they have animations, they have cartoons, they have storytelling. So they make concepts like friction or gravitation really come alive. They're like a movie production studio, right? So that's how the solution is better. How big is this difference? What's it worth to customer? How much, you know, how much better? This, by the way, is the problem with digital payments. It's slightly better than using my credit card, but not much better at all, right? So I'm not willing to pay a whole lot. I'm not willing to, you know, make a huge investment in this alternative because not that much better, right? What's in it for other stakeholders besides end customers? This is important. For example, let's say you're creating a medical device innovation. You create a medical device innovation, patients may love it. But what's in it for the doctors? What's in it for the hospitals? What's in it for the insurance companies? You really have to think through all of these stakeholders in your ecosystem. What's proprietary about your idea, right? Why hasn't somebody done this before? Why is it that you were the first one to think of it? And by the way, are you sure nobody's done it before? Have you done the research? You might find that a lot of people are actually doing something similar. And lastly, what it makes your team uniquely qualified to implement the idea, right? This in summary, folks, is questions you need to ask in terms of your idea, okay? 
So one way to summarize this is to actually write a resume for your startup company. Right? So what do I mean by writing a resume for your startup company? Remember what I told you? The customer hires you to do a job for them, right? In fact, there is a framework we use in product management, which we call jobs to be done. JTBD, jobs to be done. So jobs to be done is, is basically saying, what did the customer hire you to do? And by the way, if the customer hires you to do a job, you need a resume, right? You need a resume. So if the customer has a problem, which is the job they need to get done, you offer a solution, which is your product or service, your solution has to have a resume. This is a very simple tool called the solution resume. And you basically answer the, write it out in one page, right? And you say, our idea is this. The first customers are gonna buy our product is this. These are the jobs these customers need to get done. Currently, this is what customers do. Relative to what is best available today, this is what we are going to offer to them. Now, in order to buy and use our product, customers are gonna to have to pay this much and take this, you know, so what are we gonna ask for customers from? Here's how we're gonna make money. Here's how we are going to go to market and customers and reach our customers. These are the partnerships we will need and we are going to win against competition because this is what makes us different. And by the way, these are our critical assumptions and this is our plan to learn or to test these assumptions. That folks is a summary, a very quick way to summarize whether you have an idea to work on, okay? Here's an example of a solution resume. By the way, this is a startup company that I worked with in Chicago. It's called Motobag. So the idea is that we want to create a motorized rideable carry-on bag for travelers. The first customers who will buy our bag are people who have mobility problems. By the way, this is called the carry-on that carries you. It's kind of an interesting idea. You ride on your bag, right? Uh, these customers currently walk or they use electric carts. Uh, our solution is better because customers don't have to ask for help and they can also maneuver easily in crowded airports. However, customers will have to pay more for our bag and the bag, by the way, half the bag is consumed by the battery. So the storage capacity of this bag is less, right? We will get to market through our luggage stores or through our own stores, right? Our website. We will need to partner with airlines and luggage manufacturers, right? Because airlines need to approve this bag. And what do we need? What are our key assumptions? We need to learn what is the trade-off between weight and capacity and battery life. So for example, if I put a big battery into this, it's going to, you know, you can ride the bag for longer, but then you can store less on it. Or if you want more storage, it's going to be expensive because you know what? The size of the bag is limited by the carry-on. So you have to decide how much of this I'm going to put in the battery and how much I'm going to leave for storage space. By the way, this bag weighs 22 pounds. So it's without anything in it. So that becomes a problem, right? Uh, also, you might have to look at other assumptions like, is there going to be a problem carrying batteries on a plane? Right, because if that becomes illegal, then you got no business. Okay, so that's the first. Uh, another way to describe your uh, your 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 idea is what we call the future press release or the vision press release. This is something that people at Amazon do regularly. This is an internal document that you actually write a newspaper article about your future pro product. You know what is the what is the name of the product. What is the benefit to the customer? Summary of the product and the benefit, the problem we're solving and so on. By the way, these look very similar to what we had in the solution resume. This is just another way of describing it. So you can either do the solution resume or you can do the vision press release or the future press release. Those are ways to describe your customer problem, okay? Now let's talk about the team, okay? So you need, I, I joke sometimes uh, that in a startup, you need only two people. One person to make stuff and one person to sell stuff. The rest is overhead. But that's an oversimplification. But there is a sort of an idea. There are people who make stuff and there are people who sell stuff. And then there are people who keep the ship running. These are three legs to a startup team. The engineering team or the technology team, the go-to-market team, marketing, sales, and business development. And then you need the finance and administration and all of the, the HR and all of the other uh, support function. Right? And then, of course, you need a team leader uh, who's the president and CEO. Now, in, in hiring teams, I've seen people make mistakes. You know, Don't hire just the people you know. You know, I, 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 I like to tell people, you don't know enough people, right? Uh, somebody once told me, you know what? You're the smartest pe person I know. I said, you know what? You need to meet more people because I'm, I'm not that smart. So, uh, so don't hire just based on convenience on the people you know. You really need to spread your network wider. 
don't hire without due diligence, right? You can sometimes, you know, the chemistry is wrong. The person has a, you know, a bad track record. They've, they've had a history of uh, being in trouble with other team members and so on. Don't try to hire big company stars. Just because you succeeded at Hewlett Packard or Microsoft doesn't mean you'll work in a startup company because some people who are big company stars don't work so well in small companies. Hiring the wrong attitude. By the way, I like to say, I don't, you know, your attitude is a predictor of your altitude. So if you hire the wrong attitude, if you know, they will, that actually attitude will not only be bad for that person, it'll be bad for the entire team. Don't hire people who don't listen, who don't listen, take feedback, right? Don't hire high powered CFO, high powered CMO, chief VP of sales early on. You're still building the product. You don't need all that. I put this, outsource your, your accounting and your finance initially. As you grow, as you become bigger, then it's okay, right? Then you can get a CP. And uh, the same thing with you know, hiring a VP of sales. I've seen a company, they had no product, but they had a VP of sales. I said, what are you selling? He's like, well, I'm planning to sell what we will make. I said, then we should plan to hire you when you have something to sell, okay? So investors will ask you the following questions for the team, right? Is the team leader passionate? Passion is so important. By the way, if you look at what Elon Musk does at Tesla, the passion he brings to the, prop, the, 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 the game. If you, you know, in my work with Mukesh Ambani in, in, at Reliance, the passion that he personally brings, that is why I find sometimes that founder-led companies have a lot of passion. We have Steve Jobs at Apple, Bill Gates at Microsoft. You know, these are all companies who like were driving Mark Benioff at Salesforce, right? It's a passion. And then, you know, they will also ask, is, is this leader someone who can attract talent? Are they a talent magnet? Will people want to work for them? Will people want to, you know, go to battle with them? And is the team appropriate for the stage of the company? As I said, if it's an early stage company, you just need business development and you need engineering. You don't need anything else, right? So is that the appropriate team? Do they have too much overhead? They have too many, you know. Uh, has the team worked together before? By the way, my brother is an entrepreneur and he's based in Boston and he has founded 17 companies. And in many of those companies, he's brought the people along. So today, if an investor looks at his next company, he's like, been there, done that, they know how to do this. A lot of the initial getting to know each other, seeing how people work has been already solved, right? Is there a strong technical leader and a strong business development leader, right? Who's going to build the technology and who's going to actually do the go to market, right? And, uh, and does the team take feedback? Do they listen? These are some questions that investors ask, right? Now, what makes a great founder? What makes a great startup CEO? Passion, I told you about integrity, integrity. You have to be intellectually honest, values driven, because you can take shortcuts, you know, uh, uh, ethical shortcuts, but it's going to bite you in the long run. Don't work for a company where you suspect the ethics of the founder. Openness, openness to feedback. Not my idea, but the best idea that wins. Ability to delegate, ability to sort of let go and say, go run with it. Because I find sometimes people don't want to let go because that's like my baby. I want to do everything in this and make every decision. Right? Strong communication skills, ability to actually sell. There are some startup CEOs I've met who are like, who can sell snow to an Eskimo, right? It's really about their abilities. Ability to take risks and make the big, make the call, make the judgment calls for the tough decisions. And finally, this is something Satya Nadella talks about a lot at Microsoft, humility. A beginner's mindset. He called it a beginner's mindset, which is to say, I don't have all the answers. I'm here to learn. You know, this, by the way, humility keeps you open to feedback and open to alternative suggestions and ideas. Now, what do the people who work for a startup company want? What does the team want? They want to be compensated fairly. They don't want to make the most money they can, but they want fair compensation. Fair in relation to what the leadership team gets, fair in relation to what they can get elsewhere. They also want good chemistry, good people to work with, good culture, good work culture. You know, the ability to actually perform with excellence, freedom to take risks, and a, a good understanding of where do I fit in? How do I fit in into the larger scheme of thing, right? So that's sort of the, and it's really, I tell you that when I tell my students when they're joining a startup company, I said, evaluate this. Is it a fun place to work with? Are these people that you want to, because you know what? You're going to be spending more time with the, your peop, the team than with your spouse. So make sure that you like these people, okay? Now, besides the people who work for your company as a startup, you also need to think about board of directors and board of advisors, right? By the way, when you get started, all you need is a board of advisors. You don't need the board of directors as a small company. So board of advisors, very important in the early stage. Uh, well, who are these people? They are people who can contribute three things, one of three things. 
strategy and advice, relationships and connections to customers or to potential employees and potentially money, right? So these are three things or access to money, access to capital, access to talent, access to ideas and advice. So be very clear, what are you looking for? I currently am on the advisory boards of about 10 startup companies and it's very clear what I offer to them, number one is strategy because I have a lot of experience. I've worked with you know over 50 startups over the years. So I know what mistakes people make. I know so I can guide them on strategy. That's what they're looking for from me. They're not looking for, for money. I don't have money to give them. You know, so be clear that you're, by the way, you need about four, five, four to six people in the advisory board, bring compliment, complementary skill sets. You should have somebody who knows the domain really well. Let's say you're building an insure tech startup. You need somebody who's been in insurance, senior executive in insurance. You need somebody who can advise you on technology. You need somebody who can connect you with customers. You need some, somebody who can give you advice and strategy. And you need someone who knows venture capitalists, private equity firms who can get access to money. So that's really important at the early stage, right? So that's what I mean, that the board of advisors, each advisor should serve a very specific role. The board of directors is needed later in the game, right? Because they are, that, that's when you start to bring in professional investors, when you start to bring in, you know, venture capitalists and private equity, then they will add their members to the board. Now you need to convene a board, right? So this is where, you know, they need to represent shareholders. They also will decide on management compensation. Be careful how you select the board of directors because, they can kick you out as the startup founder. So that's, this is very, very important. And you need to balance the board in a way that you still retain majority ownership and majority decision-making authority, right? All right, let's talk about the plan. Right? So we talked about uh, the idea, we talked about the team, now let's talk about the plan. So what is a business plan, right? A business plan, by the way, you know, people get too carried away by business plans. I mean, the business plan is nothing but a roadmap. It's a roadmap that you need to tell you, where am I going? What are my priorities? What are the milestones? And it's also a way to communicate to external entities, to your team, and also to investors. Here's what we plan to do. This is our idea in brief, right? So, so it's really sort of, uh, now that said, a business plan is only a snapshot. It's, it's, it's like a you know plan at one point in time, but startups are a movie. Things evolve, things change. So your business plan, you know, in fact, uh, um, there was a very interesting quote that, that about a business plan that I, I, I heard. It says like, I've seen, this was a venture capitalist saying, I have very few business plans survive their first contact with a customer. First time you go out to a customer, you realize my plan was wrong. I need to pivot. I need to change. So that's okay. But, you know, if you didn't have a plan, you wouldn't know where to pivot. And there's a story told about the Indian railways. So kya hua bahut saal pehle, this guy comes to the, the, the station master. And he says, I'm very angry. So he said, what, what, what happened? So he said, this train was 10 hours late. My train was 10 hours late. Why do you have this schedule, right? Why do you have the schedule? He throws the schedule at the station master. Station master says, Sunye, agar aapke paas schedule nahi hota, to aapko kaise pata lagta ke train 10 ghente late thi? So there is still a value of the of the of the plan. So that's the thing. Even if you're going to deviate from the plan, if you didn't have a plan, you wouldn't know what the deviation was. So it's important to actually, and I like to say that planning is more important than the plan. The process, it makes you think, it makes you structure, it makes you sort of put your thoughts down on paper, and it uh, it, it makes you to, you know, gives you a way to communicate to others what you're working on. So, so think about that, that plan as a communication tool, plan as a thinking tool, not something that, you know, you get too carried away by, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the details of the plan, right? So how do you write a good business plan? Keep it short. Get very quickly to what is the customer problem you're solving, right? Tell me in the first page of the plan, why should I care about your problem? Or why should I, why should the customer care about this problem being solved? What's compelling? Also tell me, how are you going to make money? What is your monetization model? right? Um, give me a picture of how your company is going to evolve. What is it going to look like 12 months, 24 months, 36 months? What's the roadmap, right? What are the next things you're going to do? Next markets you're going to get into? Next evolution of your product? What are your projections? Revenue projections. By the way, revenue projections are the least reliable thing in a business plan. But, you know, what are your assumptions? Do a ground up assessment, bottom up assessment of your market potential and a top down assessment. Show me those numbers, right? 
what are your key assumptions that could that could kill you what are the four five key things that could kill you what are the risk factors how much money do you need to scale up this company and what are you going to do with the money right and how are you going to exit what is the exit plan right by the way even before you think about entry you have to think about exit so that's what needs to go into a plan right the other thing about a plan is what we call pro forma financial this is kind of your rough calculations of how the economics of your business are going to look so so there what i like to see is does it make sense i don't get into details of the spreadsheets so let me give you an example i met a startup company and they said i said what do you do he said we are doing a, we're building a piece of software for insurance companies that that they can use to do underwriting i said okay who are your target customers fortune 500 big insurance companies i said okay how many customers can you get in the first year? They said, we're planning to get about five accounts in the first year and 10 accounts in the second year. I asked them, what is your average deal size, right? What is the average revenue that you're going to get from a customer? They said, about $50,000. I said, I'm not interested in your company. Right then. Why? The numbers don't make sense. If you're an enterprise software company selling to Fortune 500 companies, we're going to take you six to 12 months to, to acquire a customer. You have to generate a million dollars per customer. You have to have a large enough account, average revenue per account. Otherwise, it's not interesting. So there are basic things that you need to think about. Some basic metrics like what's my CAC? What's my customer acquisition cost? What's my customer lifetime value? What is my total contract value? What is my annual recurring revenue uh, per customer? Right? What is my average revenue per account, ARPA? Right? So these are some of the questions that you need to think about the metrics. So I look at these sorts of things. What are the core assumptions, right? So everything needs to fit together. Your plan, your pro forma financials have to make sense. You know, what's your gross margin percentage? You know, your, what's your business sales model? So for example, if you are a B2C company and you say, I'm going to go acquire customers by sending people to personally sell. No, your sales channel is inconsistent. It's too high cost a channel. If you're a B2B company, on the other hand, you tell me, I'm a B2B company, I'm selling a product that's going to cost $100,000, and I'm going to do digital marketing, and I'm only going to do e-commerce. No, it's not going to work. You need salespeople. So all those things need to make sense. So this is the idea of like pro forma financials. The numbers are not in, as interesting as the assumptions behind them, the logic behind them, the consistency of the assumptions, uh, all that needs to make sense. Okay, And the risks. Don't be afraid of telling investors what your risks are. They will figure them out. Don't hide. Every startup has risks, right? So you need to think about, you know, what is the risk that, that we have and what is the management team doing to validate those risks, to mitigate those risks, to eliminate the risk, right? All right, let's talk about money. That's the fourth thing, right? So in money, typically the sequence is that initially you might use your own money. Then you go reach out to friends and family. Then you reach out to angel investors. Then you get to venture investors, which is series A is the first formal plan. And then you get to strategic investors, corporate partners. Then you get to private equity and late stage investors and growth stage investors, finally public market. So that's the typical sequence. And you might go through series A all the way to, you know, companies like Uber went through series G, you know. All, all. So what I have learned about raising money, first thing I ask an entrepreneur is, did you put your own money in? Or did you not take a salary? What's your sweat equity, right? So remember that. And the other thing is size of pie wins every time over share of pie. Don't try to be greedy. What you want to do is to grow the business, to grow the market. You know one a fatal mistake that startups can make? Get too high a valuation early on. If you get too high a valuation early on, then you're going to actually do work really hard to sustain that valuation. And in the long run, you might suffer, right? So that's something you want to think about. And... Um, Early in, in a startup company's life, I said, don't value your company. Don't get, because you know, angel investors can't value your company. You should write a promissory note. A promissory note is a debt instrument that you offer to your investors. Say, I'm gonna give you 6% interest. It's a loan. The moment a professional investor comes in, we will convert this into equity and we'll give you a 25% or 30% extra shares. That's the way to do it, right? So be careful because once you get a venture capitalist in your business, the clock is ticking because they want to exit, right? And money should be raised when it's available, not when you need it. Not when you, because when you need it, they won't give you the money. And it's going to take you a lot longer than you think. It's going to be a lot harder. Okay. All right. Last thing I want to talk about is execution challenges. 
So a startup faces lots of interesting execution dilemmas. On the one hand, should I stay focused on a particular problem and it turns out to be the wrong problem to solve? But on the other hand, if I'm flexible, should I spread, will I spread myself too thin? Will I try to do too many things, right? So should I keep my options open to be responsive to signals from the market? Or should I commit to a strategy and execute on it? The other trade-off is service versus product. I, what I like about services or services-oriented startup companies is you get money in immediately, put food on the table, right? But on the other hand, it doesn't scale well because services have variable costs. On the other hand, I'd love to build a business like Google, which just scales without limits. But, on the, but, but the problem is, how do I build this in a way that I know I'm building the right product? Also, choice of customers. Should I be opportunistic? Should I go after any customer who will do business with me? Or should I be strategic and say no to certain customers? So one of the interesting things I've found is that if you, as you grow your startup company, as you scale it, you need to reverse your strategies in many cases. I call these strategic reversals or shifts. So for instance, opportunistic strategic and choice of customers. You might start out by saying, I'm going to experiment. I'm going to try out different customer segments, different solutions, because I don't know where the sweet spot is. It's kind of the game we used to play as children, blind, as the blind man's buff, right? Hot, hot, not hot. It's okay. But the moment you start to figure out that the insurance market is receptive, retail is not, lock in. Lock in and become strategic. If you become strategic too early, it can be a mistake. If you stay opportunistic too long, it can be a mistake. Also, start out with projects. Do consulting projects for your customers. But then as you start to see, oh, I'm getting the same kind of project over and over again. I could productize this. I could build something that was through automation. So shift from projects to products. Also, initially, you got to own your capabilities. You got to own your channels. You got to own all of your destiny. But as you scale, you might need partners because you don't have enough reach. You don't have enough scale. You can't do it all yourself. So you want to leverage partnerships to be able to scale your company uh, you know, and, and their customer base. In people to process. This is the fourth shift. Initially, you rely on people. You rely on their intangible assets and their skills and so on. But as you grow, this learning that people have in their heads needs to be put into process. You need to institutionalize process because if you don't do that, you won't be able to scale your organization. And if your core people leave, you'll be left with nothing. So you actually need to build process, build systems, build structure if you want to scale. And lastly, initially, what is marketing? It's all relationships. People will do business with you because they trust you, because they know you personally. But you can't keep doing that if you grow. If you grow, you'll have to reach customers that you've never met in person. That's what is called a brand. A brand is a proxy for a relationship. So invest in building a brand that will allow you to reach new customers, even if you can't reach them personally. But you can't build a brand too soon, and you can't rely on relationships only for too long. So this, in summary, are some shifts that you need to make as you scale and try to grow to a larger uh, organization. So that is uh, what I wanted to share in terms of strategy in the startup firm. And, uh, you know, we talked about five core ideas. We talked about sort of the, the customer problem or the idea. We talked about the team. We talked about the financing. We talked about the plan. And we talked about execution. So we have exactly 10 minutes left, as I, as I promised. I'm going to now turn it over to our uh, hosts uh, for the questions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mohan. That was a very, very informative session. Uh, Dr. Shahid Qureshi, if you're there, because I can see you, I think he's having some connection. Actually, uh, Dr. Abbasi has raised his hand. So Dr. Yes, Abbasi, yes. go, I'm go ahead and that. ask your question. Yeah. Gee, Dr. Nadeem Abbasi, please unmute yourself. mute okay thank you for it's a very good uh, I, i'm not a direct uh, uh, business school student i'm only a simple doctor but i really enjoyed and learned a lot of things and entrepreneurship just please elaborate further when you say uh, that planning is more important than the actual plan because uh, from the causation uh, whatever i understand i'm a very amateur person a very humble student uh, that causation and effectuation theories Mm -hmm. are in contrast with each other and here we don't emphasize too much on the plan but you said something very new today which i heard first time that planning is more important your emphasis at least on emphasizing more than the plan kindly you further elaborate for a person like me amateur people and more younger students maybe i would say thank you very no, much no, i think uh, and again a great, 
that's a great question Thank dr basi and you know um, there is another way that we like to t- say talk about this that sometimes the journey is more important than the destination right because what happens in the process of planning is you're forced to ask yourself questions how am i going to make money you know how am i going to prevent competitors from doing what i'm doing you know what is my uh, unit economics look like so by questioning yourself by forcing yourself to think about the assumptions you get a better understanding of your business because you're doing a sanity check you're pushing the boundaries now what comes out as a result the plan the document less interesting more important is the thought process because it forces you to go through the checklist of questions and to be able to sell it and communicate it to other investors that is a very valuable process so journey destination is important don't get me wrong the plan is relevant but it's really the thought process the rigor and the thought process that will help you in the long run or are we going to go to tahira next hello tasdeer uh, sal assalam alaikum that's right guys very welcome. nice session um, it's a thought provoking session i am tahira from uh, university of the punjab now in pakistan my question is you you were talking about very really interesting sorry for this मैंने बिठा लो उनके साथ में आज आजकल तो यही है हमारी लाइफ ना बट माय 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 कैट शोज अप इन कॉल्स बोलो कैट एंड सो क्वेश्चन कि जो जो आपने आपने बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग था वो वो सेवन सेवन टेस्ट टेस्ट बताएंगे पास होने चाहिए हमें सबका आंसर तो यस नहीं हो सकता एंड बाय द वे तायरा इट्स नॉट इवन अ यस नो क्वेश्चन इट्स अ जीरो टू टेन स्केल राइट सो सो इट्स रियली काइंड ऑफ यू नो तो अगर व्हाट आई वुड डू इफ आई वांट टू मेक दिस मोर स्ट्रक्चर्ड इज के आप सात क्वेश्चन उसमें दस नंबर पे स्कोर करो देन से चालीस नंबर आए के नहीं पैंतालीस नंबर आए के नहीं राइट सो इट्स बेसिकली काइंड ऑफ ए मोर इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग इज दैट इट्स अ क्वालिटेटिव असेसमेंट Okay. It tells okay. you that overall, you know, and I and there's no hard number that three out of seven, four out of seven, but mm-hmm. I think uh, one thing I would be very cautious about is a zero score on any of those, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. to say, okay. ke, you know, ये तो problem है ही नहीं. The customer doesn't okay. have this problem. Then everything else mm-hmm. is, you know, useless. But uh, but I think it's more of a kind of a checklist that you need to think through, and it's a scale. It's not a zero one. It's not a binary. uh but but yeah, as you, uh, so as you go through this thought process you say uh you know so do i make a so for example i can make a trade off that it's a very very important pain point but there are it's not a very large market right so abhi dr abasi is a doctor so he would know that you know we are doing now developing these uh gene based therapies that are for rare uh, uh diseases उसमें क्या है दर मे बी अ ड्रग दैट यू बिल्ड ओनली वन थाउजेंड पेशेंट्स इन द एंटायर वर्ल्ड हैव दिस प्रॉब्लम बट यू कैन चार्ज वन मिलियन डॉलर्स टू ईच पेशेंट और हंड्रेड थाउजेंड डॉलर्स टू ईच पेशेंट ठीक है ओके सो अल्टीमेटली द मैथ हैज टू ऐड अप राइट ऑल ऑफ दिस थिंग्स ओके ऑलराइट थैंक यू थैंक्स ओके सो इस्माइल आई सी योर हैंड नेक्स्ट या मास प्लीज गो अहेड हाँ जी माज आप हो यस हाय डॉक्टर प्रोफेसर मोहन माय नेम इज माज इनसाइटफुल सेशन माय क्वेश्चन इज रिगार्डिंग फॉर एंटरप्रेन्योर्स वी से 80 परसेंट ऑफ स्टार्टअप्स एंड अप फेलियर विथ इन द फर्स्ट टू इयर्स ऑफ द स्टार्टिंग व्हिच पेन पॉइंट्स आर टू बी हाइलाइट बेस्ड ऑन योर एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ कोर्स यू वुड लाइक टू हाइलाइट आर you get so excited about your product you forget that it, that there has to be a customer who has a problem right so it's really sort of uh, being focused on a fixed idea of what product or service you want to build but not really mm-hmm. listening to customers and not adjusting and adapting that's one very 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 important most common problem that i see that there is no viable customer problem to be solved or that there are alternative solutions that are good enough and there is so that's one uh, important thing the other thing that i see more very commonly is lack of focus that you're trying to do everything to everybody 
remember i told you i told you a very subtle thing in the solution resume i hope you picked it up i said not who are the customers who will want your product who are the first set of customers who will break down your doors and say i desperately need your product if you can't yes. define who that core target is who have a very intense need or a pain then you know you're not focused so lack of focus lack of sort of you know clarity around what is the customer problem that you're solving and then the third thing is execution capability right you just don't have the 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 team that can actually or the resources that can execute these are three big things that i've seen as